How's the Detroit Sports Podcast going? This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. The good thing about the Doc and Jock podcast, we are not dysfunctional. I am the Doc oh, John Macaroon. No, we are not. <laughs> not like the Lakers or the Lions, but we are dysfunctional. Welcome in, in everybody. Way. Yes, sir. Welcome in. Uh, I am the Doc John Macaroon. Joining me, Adam the Jock Strozinski. Thanks, everyone, for downloading episode 304 of our podcast. I can't wait to talk to you about all things Michigan sports. Uh, we're going to talk about Juwan Howard, who today... As you're downloading this, he will be addressing the media, taking your questions, probably will be discussing the future of what uh, involvement the Fab Five will have with that program. Second half of the podcast, you definitely want to tune in. Um, We're going to talk about two dysfunctional organizations, the Lakers and the Detroit Lions, and we're going to debate which franchise is more dysfunctional. If you have not had a chance to read the piece from ESPN. It's like 6,000 words on the behind the scenes issues of the Lakers front office drama, Magic showing up once a week, what's going on with Rob Palinka and Magic having one war room, the scouts having another. Talk about this function. I can't wait to talk about it because you and I probably will have different stances. But uh, I want to start the podcast just talking about and recapping the fact that Vito and I got a chance uh, to go out to the wait, Detroit Golf Club. Before we get into that, all right, you you were able to to listen to my entire show from Monday, from Memorial Day. What did you think? Honest opinion. If it sucked, it sucked. If it was decent, it was decent. If I'm an okay number one, I'm an okay number one. If I'm a better two, I'm a better two. What did you think? First of all, I'm, uh, I'm talking about my preference here. Yes. I don't prefer shows with three hosts. Right. Because it's a lot of voices, and you're like, okay, who's kicking to who? You have to kind of direct it. But you did a great job. I felt like you involved Ryan and Little B, uh, Brendan Riley, very well. It was an enjoyable show. I'm a fan of sports radio. Um, it just kind of sucked for you guys that it was a beautiful day mm-hmm. in that I could listen to the first 40 minutes, great topics. Uh, I would say in this market in Detroit, hockey and basketball – aren't really talked about in terms of driving engagement a whole heck of a lot outside of really hardcore nerds. Mm -hmm. So as a radio show, I think that you could have uh, topic-driven, maybe eliminated the basketball talk, stuck really heavily with the Lions and Michigan. You could have carried that the whole show. I felt like uh, the show was great. You guys have fun banter. You checked each other really great. I love that uh, when you said stupid things, Little B called you out. Ryan uh, did his thing as well. I would say that The way I looked at it and took it in, the first segment was awesome. I wanted to go more, and boom, you went to another topic. Mm -hmm. And it was like you did 15 minutes on a topic, and then it didn't go any further because you went right to the the next thing real fast. So other than like little idiosyncrasies, the show was great. I loved it. I listened to the entire uh, recap podcast. I listened to the first 40 minutes of it live. It was great. But uh, I would say that the timing, like I said, being a beautiful day on Memorial Day makes it really hard to get a lot of people to be engaged with the show. But – the content was great. I just would have eliminated a couple things and f- talked more about the things that, you know, the, the opening topic the was amazing. Issues. Yeah, yeah. The, the hot takes with uh, Michigan and Michigan State. It was like, okay, here we are. Boom, we got to talk basketball. It's like, I would have been like, you know what? Who cares about the Raptors? Who cares about uh, those kind of things, especially on a day when, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to get a bunch of ears. So when we put a show together like that, there are segments in there where you're like, okay, cool. If things are hitting and firing, we can eliminate this. And while the, the conversation was good between the three of us for, for the two segments on the Michigan stuff, we weren't getting any texts. We weren't really yeah. getting any tweets. So it was hard to gauge that. So it's like, okay, cool. Let's just kind of switch gears a little bit and transition into this. And then we'll come back with something else. And it, just because, like you said, nice day. Oh. Nobody's really listening because uh, yeah. it's a holiday. Oh, yeah. So it was hard to gauge the involvement. But that was one of those topics where if we need to pull something or we need yeah. to kind of structure it a little bit different – we can move that one around. It, it just we didn't have we didn't have the the engagement on on Twitter or through the text or through the. So phones I ask you this: to, with basketball really talk, engage. did you get more 
No, you yeah, see? you got really nothing. Exactly. But you're you're right. You did read texts and tweets uh, mm-hmm. in regards to the Michigan stuff and talking yes. and talking about your bold takes. It could have went a lot of different ways, at, you know, and talked about a couple more subjects mm-hmm. in terms of you guys' uh, thoughts on Shea Patterson, what Michigan needs to do. Uh, someone texted in really bright, talking about Jim Harbaugh being Firing fired. Jim Harbaugh, yeah, really bright guy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I love you. Yeah. You're the fucking best. Yeah, and 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 little B said it. That's bold. And that is bold. You went a little safe in terms of oh, Michigan's going to win the Big Ten. Uh, that's, that's not safe. bold. Yeah, we'll talk about that. I don't in think that's May? bold. I don't think that's bold. No, no. Winning. I mean, that's what people when, would expect. When have they finished better than third in the Big Ten under Jim Harbaugh? Based on previous expectations, it is bold. When? But it's not. bold. Bold. It's like okay, like little B told you. It's like okay, it's, and, it's, and uh, I have said numerous times. I just feel like it's rehashing the same topic. Like I have said, Jim Harbaugh should yeah, be fired if yeah. they don't win the the, the Big Ten this year. Yeah. Like I've already said that. So I didn't feel like that was that was all that bold coming from me again. Do you know what I'm saying? I thought me going out there saying they are going to win the Big Ten this year and they're going to make the playoffs. I thought that was bold. But I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. How did you enjoy doing the show? Memorial Day, planning it out, obviously having yeah. to work, you know, being there. What was it like? It was, uh, it was really, really enjoyable, actually. Yeah. So little B brings a different perspective. He is, he's trained a little bit differently than I am. I, I really have no direction working at the radio station. It's everything that that I do is because I impose. Uh, I, I'm very structured, so I impose the 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 strict things that I have to do every single day. Right? It, it's all me. And I'm the one who has to keep me in check. I've got really nobody that that I work with, and I've got really nobody that says, "Hey, you need to you need to think of an idea like this. You've got to look for this." Like everything that I do is stuff that I've learned with us doing stuff, or it, it's listening to other people and being like, "Okay, cool." So he has he has intimate knowledge of how Drew and Jim put a show together. He is he's basically trained and, and has been coached. To, to put a show together a little bit differently than I do. So when we do it for the podcast, we put shows together. Like, what can we talk about? What can we, what can we develop a conversation from? The way they put a show together is, what's your take? Yes. You know, how, how do you, what's your opinion on this? Is it, is it a bold enough opinion where you can carry that for 15, 20 minutes? So it's different. Yeah. And I, I found it really enjoyable working with him because he comes from a, he comes from a different perspective with putting a show together. You know, I'm looking more long form. He's looking more get in and, and, and kind of jab you. I'm looking to kind of beat you up for, for two or three rounds. Do you know? So it's a little bit different approach, and it, it worked really, really well because yeah. I just found the way our styles kind of mesh together, it, 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 they complement each other really, really nicely. So I thought it was really, really good. Um, like I said, things that you and I have done over the course of the last six years really have helped me develop a, a perspective and, and really – Help me develop uh, ways to put a show together. Doing it with him, it's a little bit different, and I, I find it to be. I find the 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 give and take, the the kind of pull, the the, the tug of war. I found it to be really really nice, and the way we put the show together, I thought worked really really well. Uh, worked Ryan in on a couple different things that we were kicking around before that didn't quite make the show, but were just interesting going back and forth in, in a round table type of discussion. So I, I thought it was really good. I thought it was really nice. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, little B and I will be doing a podcast uh, every every Wednesday evening. You can get that on the iHeartRadio app. Uh, it's called the the Practice Squad. Should be a good time. There's a video of me being essentially naked. You see everything but my ween and my butt cheeks. It, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> As they say in the business, on brand. <laughs> on brand, yes, very very on brand for me. <laughs> so I thought it was good. Um, and that was just an idea that we had, and we agreed upon it, and it worked out really really well. Uh, but- Thirty minutes, hopefully. The, for the podcast, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping 30 minutes, maybe okay. 45. It, yeah, it, it, it's going to be that's a nice pocket for most yeah. podcasts because man, there's so many good ones. Like uh, I've just subscribed to Busted Open, the one on Sirius, and then there are some podcasts that just pop up that you got to listen to. Like when uh, John Moxley goes and trashes WWE, you got to look like, oh man, because I listen to maybe three regularly and mm-hmm. it takes away from that. You're like, man, there's not enough hours in the day to listen to everything so that has some great content. Now it's really good too. You and I can uh, sit back and, and really go, man. A lot more radio stations are really embracing podcasts mm-hmm. and understanding, oh, you know what? Come up with creative names. Come up with uh, you know, interviews with these athletes and get them to say something. 
you know, what a novel idea, huh? Right. More people should try it. <laughs> Crazy, right? Crazy idea. Absolutely nuts. Too bad we were ahead of the curve six years ago, right? Six years. I mean, <laughs> it, it, I really didn't feel like it should have been... It, I don't feel like it should have took six years for people to catch on. Like, hey, don't what a crazy idea it is to just get people to talk in a free-flowing way, uh, uninterrupted by commercials. I think it's pretty fair. I mean, I give you all all the credit in the world. You were the you were the visionary of all of this. You started doing you started doing this odd little thing where every every week you would dump something onto Facebook, and it was yeah. like your take on politics and, yeah. and whatever else. Yeah, and I was like, what the hell is he doing? Yeah, so exactly. I listened to a couple of them, and the next thing you know, you're like, hey. Let's do a sports, sports podcast. One. That was better. Way more fun for me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. And when we started doing it, I was like, I don't know why more people aren't doing this. Exactly. You can say whatever you want to say, do whatever you want to do. I don't know why more people aren't doing exactly. stuff like this. You know? So it, it was a great idea six years ago. Yes. I give you all the credit in the world for being the visionary of all of this. And so guess so, what? So kudos. I never heard of the Detroit Golf Club until this no? tournament showed up. Never. Really? Seven at Woodward. It's like right here. Yeah. It's like 15 minutes from the office. Yeah. So obviously the good you never thing. never golfed it? No, I never played no. it. Never. No, I'm not really too much of a golfer. I like going and, uh, you know, for eight bucks, you can hit a bucket of balls. You can take your time. You can listen to the radio, have a drink, relax. You know, I don't like in terms of uh, range versus going out, mm-hmm. you know, playing golf three and a half hours, whacking the ball all over the place. Just not my cup of tea because I don't engage in the side stuff that a lot of people do, mm-hmm. you know, slamming back the Bud Lights and doing other stuff. I don't like all that. So for me, nine holes is good. Uh, or going out to the range, just kind of whacking the balls all over the place and uh, getting your swing back in order. For a time there, the swing was okay, but for the last two years, focus has been elsewhere. So to be able to be invited to go check out Media Day for the Detroit Golf Club, the funny part was uh, I didn't get, I got the first invite, but I didn't get the RSVP email. Mm-hmm. For some reason, it was miscommunication. So I'm like, oh, you know, I got to save the date. So uh, Memorial Day night, and I'm like, hey, uh, what time is it tomorrow? He's like, oh, sorry, I didn't get you the RSVP email. Do you want to golf? I'm like, no, I don't want to golf. I just want to come cover the presser. Lunch at 11, uh, presser at noon. I'm like, perfect. I'm like, hey, Vito, uh, you know, I messaged him at 8 in the morning. Hey, do you want to come with me? I think this is going to be fun and an opportunity at least to see the golf course mm-hmm. and to see something that I'm like, man, we, I've never heard of it. I don't know if it wasn't ever promoted because, like I said, I'm on Twitter a lot, and I do sense a lot of things uh, you know, from people that retweet stuff. And it's just that golf course never really was talked about mm-hmm. uh, by members. Or it's like, hey, I went to play this or that. I never really came across it in five years. So all of a sudden you, you check out this golf course. You're like, man, it's right here on 7 and Woodward. Mm-hmm. A beautiful course, man. It was nice. Uh, Vito, the funny part was he took it like a casual event. He showed up like a t-shirt and shorts. I'm no, like, oh, really? Look at the photo on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast. I'm like, Vito. And he's like, yeah, it's last minute, bro. I'm like, sorry. And I'm like, okay. So we showed up. We met the guy that uh, I was emailing back and forth. He was very gracious, uh, Greg Ball, and he was really cool. And uh, he's like, oh, thank you guys for coming. And I'm like, hey, thanks for having us. So we go, we have lunch, we have a good time, see all the media. You see all the hardcore golfers in their hats, and you're like, oh, my God, these guys live for this kind of stuff. So I went, I had a golf good time. Golf is so much fun, man. I it, love it, golf. It's a fun thing I'm to do. I'm not good. I need to get some new clubs. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like one of those things where you say about golf, it's a great way to network. It's a great mm-hmm. way to get people together and just, you know, because most people aren't that good. But there are some people in the media that take this thing seriously. And, uh, hey, man. All, Friend Mark of the could, podcast, yep. Justin Rose is Loves one. it. Loves it. He's yep. in his straight and, uh, you know, obviously got a chance to say hi to him, uh, say hi to a couple other media members. And we still get that look of, like, you know, people reading our patch mm-hmm. and going, who are you? And things like that. But more and more people are like, oh, okay, you know, back at it. Said hi to the Hammer. Said hi to uh, other media members. But in the end... I just like to go to the pressers to get the information because for me, I like to see people, you know, that are working hard to, you know, present information in their organized way. Mm-hmm. And I like the way that they did it in that you have a moderator, you have Glenda Lewis, proud Detroiter. Mm-hmm. She's, um, moderating the discussion. You have like a 20 minute discussion, 10 minutes for questions, and you can get out a lot of your information in that way. So I like, I like it being done in that manner. Uh, obviously the first question is about Tiger Woods. He's a maybe. Again, he's not committing. He's going week by week to decide if he's going to actually show up to the tournament. They talked about how the Detroit Golf Club and the Rocket Mortgage Classic is going to be involved in the community and really bring, uh, you know, another event that could go national. And have a lot of attention being brought to the city, w- working with partners that are from the city. So it was kind a lot of a talk. damper too, because Dan Gilbert just had a stroke. That was a lot and, of the talk and as this well. Happened too. So yep. it, he he's really influential in putting all of this together and bringing this back. It was to just the nice city. to be there. And obviously, you know, when Vito and I show up somewhere, we're going to have some fun. So Vito's driving a car, doesn't know. I and like I said, the good thing is we're on the cusp of really funny content. We just got to extend it out because we're always the way I look at it is. 
when we're doing our like content and our bits, mm -hmm. there's people looking at us like, what the hell are these guys mm -hmm. doing? There's this little guy in a cart just talking, and there's this you know short overweight guy looking at him and laughing hysterically, and I always feel like, okay, we gotta rush to get out of here. And sometimes I just gotta go like five more seconds because um, we had this bit where Vito's driving the cart. And obviously we're restricted to like two minutes on Twitter to get the content out, but it was only 30 seconds that mm -hmm. I rolled on him and he stops the cart and I'm like, okay, park it. And he had stopped the cart, but he doesn't know the workings of a golf cart. Really? He, no, he, he's never golfed. No, he doesn't. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he goes, but he doesn't drive the cart. He doesn't know the thing. So if I had rolled it another 45 seconds, I could have said, Vito, Hey, reverse the cart. He would have, he would have, you know, not known what to do. I could have, you know, made fun of him more. So we're getting close to really funny, funny content. Now it's funny that we're doing it, and it's funny to see this, you know, Vito showing up in a golf cart and me driving Vito around and having fun with it. But uh, I just got to stop caring so much. Like I don't really don't care if someone like I want to. Obviously, here's the thing: the thing that goes on in my mind to let you in behind the scenes is okay. I want to be professional, yes, and entertaining, and, entertaining, yes. and I want to do a bit. I want to present. And sometimes the those things don't always go hand in hand. Exactly. So you're there to give the information, yes. which I always do. I always go there and present what's the biggest part of what's being said. But I also want to go there and act a fool a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, just, hey, we're golfing. We have no idea how to golf. Uh, obviously, if I planned this better, I would have brought clubs and had Vito swing one and have the ball explode or something funny. Right. I have to, like I said, because like I said, you don't know. Like, okay, uh, what's the line of what people will say? Okay, this is unacceptable. We'll, we'll yank the chain and not uh, let you come back here ever again. And obviously, I want to do it in a respectful kind mm -hmm. of way. But I also want to be funny. I don't care. I will say and do anything. Like I said, I'll drive a car and take a video. Uh, when the camera's on, you do that because this is fun. It's like, hey, we're at the, like, the Detroit Sports Podcast is at the Detroit Golf Club covering a media presser. It's so absurd to me. It's funny. And that, you know, you got Vito in a card and we're just having fun. That's what I want it to be is like, hey, you know, we're just two guys having fun and taking advantage of an opportunity. But like I said, I don't want people to be mad at us. That's the part I don't like. I don't want people looking at us and going, what, a not, what an ass clown. Let's not ever invite him back. I want it to be funny, but in a way that also allows us to come back. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that part is, is a fine line because I really don't care what people's opinions are. Yeah. I just don't want them to be like, hey, don't ever come back. Right. You don't, you don't want to get yourself barred from an event. Yeah. This is the problem I often have. You have to find the line, right? Yeah. And then you've got to be careful to walk up to the line and not necessarily cross over the line. Right. Normally, I cross over the line, I turn yes. around, I set it on fire, and then I pee on it. Yeah. <laughs> so you got you got to be careful not to do that. The way I look at it is is that I'm walking uh, one step behind the line. I think I can go one step further, yes. and that's what it is. Is yep. that I'm I'm like two steps ahead, closer to the line than I I, I should be. And uh, but in the end, it's still funny. People like it. Mm -hmm. They they respond to it. They, and people, I understand. Uh, look. Vito is all in on it. I, I, I'm i not that kind of guy that's like, hey, I'm going to shine the light on Vito. Vito is a good sport about everything. Vito is a good sport. And every week I say, look, you okay? We cool? I always check in with him. Mm -hmm. I tell him, look, you know, if you left, the family wouldn't be the same. So I'm not, like I said, and, and remember, look at the words I choose to use. I didn't say laugh at Vito. I said laugh with Vito. Yes. Because we're doing it to make each other laugh. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it to make him laugh because he's like, darn it, that John asked me to do something I don't know how to do. I'm like, Park the car because I knew he didn't know what he was doing because yeah. he, he he made it seem like, okay, John, you have to drive this car. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so I, obviously something's up. He's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I said, Vito, park the car. So once he got it stopped, he was totally lost. And that's the funny part of the way you do this is that Vito doesn't take himself seriously. I obviously don't take myself seriously, and we have a good time with and, it. And look, Vito's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. He's, he's, how's he going to get these checks? Exactly. Come exactly. On. Exactly. We, we keep Vito fat paid. It's yeah, okay. Exactly. He's Vito's not, fat he's, paid. He's, he's not happy. going anywhere. But that's the one thing. is. But you're right. If Vito left, the family would not be the same. Yeah, the family would not be the same. I would not have <laughs> it as much fun as I have. I Man, we try to make each other laugh. And like I did earlier on uh, <laughs> on Wednesday, you know, Andre Drummond is putting out, you know, rap videos. And I found a great picture of Vito that would have been awesome in his video. You know, MC Vito <laughs> would be great on the wake up song. But uh, it's <laughs> but he's, he's never messaged me and said, hey, that's over the line. Never, never once. And uh, he may be behind the scenes. He did. But I told him, look, if you have a problem with it, I'll just take it down. I don't really care. Yeah. We just do it to make each other laugh. Yeah. It's not to upset anybody. And like I said, yeah, right away, Vito's not even waiting anymore. He gets his check and he does the phone thing and deposits it that second. That second. That, I'm like, damn, Vito, you can walk out. <laughs> He's like, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> he, wants to, he wants to make sure it clears. <laughs> exactly. I'm putting it in right now. I'm like, damn, Vito. Uh, look, so, so he got paid this week, so he's very happy. This is the one thing I will say about the Detroit Sports Podcast. Yeah. I don't think any of us take ourselves too serious. No, we can't. I think we all, we, we all have a, a pretty good yeah. uh, tongue-in-cheek mindset. I think others take us more seriously than I we take so ourselves. Too. It's crazy. I think so, too. I think other people think that uh, 
that, that, that we're actually either A, going at them, or yeah. we're trying to make a, a mockery out of ourselves yeah. or, or them. And it's not the case. We're yeah, just trying yeah. to have a good time. Yeah, yeah. You know what? The, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to show up with a contract and start pinching some talent from the, the bigger the bigger places. <laughs> Here, I got a contract for you. You want to come do a podcast with us? <laughs> 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 like, oh, uh, I'm tr- I'm here to pinch competition. I, I know that that's going on lately. You know, bigger rivals take uh, other talents, so we're going to do that here in the market. <laughs> right. <laughs> the Detroit Sports Podcast market, right? We said that happened to us, didn't we? Yeah. Kind of, sort of. All right, today. <laughs> I like how you gloss over it. You're uh, like, moving on. Moving, moving on. on. Uh, you're you're going to pull a, a Colin Coward. Yeah. Uh, switching gears. Switching gears here on this episode of the Detroit Sports Podcast. <laughs> uh, Juwan Howard. Today, we'll be speaking and addressing the media on Thursday, and he'll finally address everybody's thoughts. And probably the bigger questions are going to be, okay, what's uh, been the involvement that you've had with John Beeline? Uh, What was the process like now that uh, the likes of Jalen Rose are talking that potentially Chris Webber's in the fold and there's going to be this massive reunion? What's that going to be like? And then the challenges now, uh, the news broke, and I'll get your sense of it, uh, Luke Yaklich has taken the job uh, at Texas, Shaka Smart with the move, pulling away talent as we've been talking about, that's going to really affect the defense and things like that. So I'm curious to get your sense of what's been your reaction to this whole scenario of Juwan Howard uh, being hired at Michigan, because we haven't really had a chance to dive deeply into it. For me, it has the feel of them settling, but on a guy that could do the job if given time. The situation, though, in sports, you don't get three, four years to do this job. He may be afforded that opportunity, but the way in which it's been framed and looked at is, Michigan didn't really have a strong pick of the litter to get this guy. Right. And Jawan Howard obviously took advantage of really a marketplace where you go, he was the best candidate. Now, in terms of the landscape of college basketball, when you hire a guy with no, no coaching experience, there's a lot of question marks. Yeah. So the way the whole thing kind of worked out, it was really bad timing. It really was. So Beeline takes the job with, with, with Cleveland and all of the big name coaches have essentially signed. They're locked up. They yeah. got their people. They're comfy. It, it, it's it's massive, massive amounts of money to buy them out. Yes. Which you would think Michigan has really deep pockets, but again, Michigan sets a limit as to how much they're going to spend to buy another coach out. All that being said, to also add information, they did like we had said on previous podcasts. Michigan did kind of hint that you know many of the coaches that they reached out to said, sorry, I'm not interested. So they did do the job in terms of PR, in terms of spinning it in a way to say, you know what, we got the guy that we think is best but also wants the job and has a connection because I think they did reach out to Chris Beard. They did reach out mm-hmm. to some bigger name coaches, but they were comfy and in terms of the timing of uh, the job search and the job opening. I feel like Michigan did get screwed in that sense, but, you know, always – as a guy that started a podcast from the basement and went to the press box, mm-hmm. you always believe that, you know what? If I flash $9 million to Chris Beard, he's going to go, hmm, okay, if it's not $9 million, what about 9.1? What about 9.2? So I don't believe in settling. Like, if you wanted Chris Beard and he's your number one target, you make the full you, core you press. Get him, you right. go get him. You, go get you him. make sure yes. that that private plane has a Chris Beard logo on the tail, yep. and you go get him. That's our guy. His giant head exactly. is on the front of, of the nose of the airplane. No, no, you're absolutely right. Everybody has a price. Yeah. And I think that's where the, those that complain about the search will say, Michigan settled because look at the price that they paid. Mm-hmm. $2 million a year for Juwan Howard yep. as opposed to the 3.8, 3.9 that Beeline was making? I'll be surprised. With, or I'll, I'll be honest. I was surprised by At the, that number? Yeah, by the amount. But then I was like, you, you kind of sit back and you look at it. Well, he's like, he has no no head coaching experience, not in the NBA or in college. This is his first real job. This is a little bit different from where he's coming. So all that being said, I, I got it, but I was still surprised Would you have the dollar offer? amount. Would you have accepted that dollar amount? If you're Juwan Howard, wouldn't you not say maybe in the threes? I think threes is respectable. Well, here's the thing, right? Look at how much Beeline was making, right? Right. And if you really want – so it, it depends on how much you value this job, right? Do you value the head coach of Michigan basketball? Do you value it a ton? Is this where you want to be? Or is this a spot that's going to help you get to wherever you want to be? That's kind of how you have to look at it. And if it's one of those two – you're going to say, yeah, I'll take that. And then we can come back to the table in a year, maybe two years, and renegotiate. And I think that's kind of where he's at. I think he really wants to be here. I think he wants to be a head coach. And I think it means something to him to be the head coach at the University of Michigan, which is great, which is fantastic. You being a Michigan supporter, are you happy that Juwan Howard has the head coach title? I would have wanted somebody else. I'll be honest with you. I wanted, I wanted Chris Beard. Chris Beard was my guy. All that being said, as this process continued on, 
I found myself rooting for Jawan Howard. I found myself being satisfied when he was the guy who was picked. And after doing a little bit of research on him, I was like, yeah, this, this guy makes sense. He makes sense. That's correct. For what Michigan wants, right? They want a Michigan man, which I think is overblown and overhyped, and I think it's dumb. I think it's a dumb thing to have on a checklist. I think it's stupid. They wanted a Michigan man, right? Michigan man checks that list. They wanted somebody with integrity. He's that guy. He's not going to get your school in trouble. John Beeline, one of the cleanest coaches in all of college basketball. Jawan Howard appears and sounds to be cut from the same exact cloth, which was important. And that's something that should be on a checklist, right? If you want to do it right, you don't want to pay for a championship. He's a guy that you go get because he's going to do it right. He's a guy who has done it at that next level, right? He's played in the NBA. He's coached in the NBA. He he has the the credentials of a guy who was backed by guys like LeBron James, arguably one of the greatest players in all of the NBA. Dwayne Wade, a big-time name. High school students know who Dwayne Wade is, right? He was backed by other guys in the league. He was backed by talking heads, guys like Jalen Rose, Chris Webber. These guys backed him. So he checks off a lot of lists or a lot of boxes on the list. He's a guy who, as this played out, I found myself being like, yeah, this was the right hire. This was this was the right hire. This was the guy. My my next thought process was, okay, how does he keep what works so well for this team? This team last year was offensively challenged. This was one of John Beeline's worst shooting teams he's ever had. This team made it as far as they made it in the NCAA tournament, and they made it as far as they made it in, in the Big Ten off that defense. So how do they keep a guy who was up for the same exact job as him? How does he retain uh, Luke Jakic? How does he get him to stay on staff? So they don't necessarily take a big step back and, and then suffer because I don't know what this recruiting class is going to be. I don't know what their offense is going to be like. How do you keep your calling card? How do you keep what, what basically got you to the dance last year? How do you keep that? And he wasn't able to do that. You just mentioned Luke, Yak- Luke Yak- Yakic is going to, to, to coach with Shaka Smart. So that's a big blow for this Michigan team. Especially with how high the defense is ranked. Exactly. That was Juwan. This was Juwan Howard's first recruiting job, and he couldn't get the job done. And that being said, I don't necessarily think it was he wasn't presenting the 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 what was necessary. I think it was more of a thing of Jakic was like, Why am I gonna stay here and work underneath you when I was up for that same job? Obviously they don't value yeah, obviously they don't value me the same way they value you. So I'm going to go someplace else exactly, and, and, and try to get this done. All that being said, Juwan Howard was able to keep parts of that coaching staff together, which I think does help the recruiting class coming in. Yes. And I'm expecting that Juwan Howard will be able to, to recruit. I do expect he'll be able to get guys here. I like the fact that he was able to keep large portions of this coaching staff that was here mm-hmm. from John Beeline intact, at least for one year. At least for one year. And I think that's what's most important. Juwan Howard is going to be figuring this out as he's going along, right? Again, first time head coach, first time coaching in college. So he's going to be figuring things out on the fly. Keeping the the parts of the coaching staff that was there prior does a couple different things. Helps keep the recruiting class intact. Helps keep the 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 guys that are here. It, it, it's a way to connect to them because you have something from the past that that they're either a willing to listen to or that prior coaching staff knows how to motivate and how to get through to these guys. So that helps him out, and that that helps makes his job that much easier. On top of that, if something doesn't work out this year, you can change it next year. So it allows you a year to kind of get your footing, get yourself in place, get your system kind of up and going, and it allows you like a one a one-year window where you can kind of figure things out, and it takes a little bit of stress off your plate. Now you brought it up. And a lot of people now are talking about it. One of the rare times, rare occurrences where both the head basketball coach and the head football coach, two prominent sports, have the have coaches that are alums. I think it's the only opportunity now in, in the entire NCAA where that's the case. And many people now are debating it like, uh, does Michigan have a fixation on you know hiring alums in terms of football and basketball? So is this idea of a Michigan man obviously started uh, back in the day by Bo Schimbeckler and has been carried on now for a couple decades, and now you really, really see it with Jim Harbaugh and uh, what's going on with the Michigan football program. Is Michigan leaning on that notion too much? Because there is this idea that if you kind of remove that 
that notion, that uh, criteria, you could actually go out and get better coaches. Yeah, I, you're, you're, you're spot on. I, I don't think it's necessary. Look at John Beeline. John Beeline's the best coach that Michigan basketball has ever had. Was he a Michigan man? The answer is no, he was not. You you really limit yourself when you put that stipulation up there, when when that is a, a go-to or that is something that has to be checked off on the list of criteria to hire a, a head coach or to hire an assistant at Michigan. I, I think it's foolhardy. I think it's I think it's narrow sighted and, and I, I just think it's I think it's dumb. I don't understand why this is part of the checklist, why this is part of the makeup for whoever the head coach of the basketball or the football team is. It doesn't make sense. Bo Schembechler and a lot of people, Bo Schembechler was the greatest coach Michigan's at football's ever had. He sucked in bowl games, guys. He never won anything. Cool. You won the Big Ten a few times. It was you and Ohio State. And basically when Ohio State's upperclassmen were leaving, your upperclassmen were staying. That's why you beat them. Go back, do some research, look at it. For as good as Bo Schembechler was, he sucked when it mattered most. And all that being said, he wasn't a Michigan man. He was from Ohio State, dummies. So I, I think it's stupid that you have to put this criteria, you have to put this made-up uh, uh, image and mark on, on, on hiring a, a head coach. And actually it's hurting. It does. It, it hurts them too because of the fact that now there's greater expectation. Yeah. Oh, this Michigan guy knows the culture. There's now going to be undue pressure on Juwan Howard to actually go out there and get five-star recruits. It, it, it is absolutely silly to do it. I get what you mean by the culture because when Rich Rod came here and Rich Rod was set up to fail. All right. I don't care what anybody says. Rich Rod was set up to fail. He was not their first choice. He was not the guy that they necessarily wanted. Rich Rod was put in a spot where he had a, a fractured house and they were like, go ahead, try to clean that up. He was put in a really, really awful spot. On top of that, when he came in, what he coached and, and the players that he, that he would utilize in his offensive scheme, totally different than what was here. Totally different. He needed smaller, faster guys. He had big, bruising power guys here. It wasn't going to work. He needed to, to curtail his, uh, his, his, his game plan, and he never did that. So he hurt himself, but all that being said, he was set up to fail. You don't need a Michigan man because of the culture. I, th- I think that's, I think that's a, it's a weak answer. It, it, it's short-sighted. You don't need to do stuff like that. John Beeline wasn't a Michigan man. Came in, he adapted. And you know what? You got your best college basketball at the University of Michigan for 12 years out of a guy who basically came from West Virginia. And, and before that, he came up through the ranks coaching high school basketball, then coaching collegiate co- or coaching um, community college, then coaching D3, D2, and then making it to D1, ending up at West Virginia where you poached him. You don't need a Michigan man. That's stupid. If, if Chris Beard, so you mean to tell me, right? You have your pick between Juwan Howard and Chris Beard. You're going to take Juwan Howard? No, you could take Chris Beard all day long because you've seen what he did. He just got to the championship game. He just took a, a, a team that, that for the most part, is overlooked by everybody in college basketball, and he stomped a mud hole in Michigan and in Michigan State's ass. Come on now. You, it, it makes no sense. All that being said, I think Jawan Howard was a good choice. I wasn't he wasn't my number one guy. He wasn't the best choice, but he was a good choice. Now, obviously, I'm gonna look at the facts, and uh, you presented that you're really happy with the hire of Jawan Howard. I'm gonna look at it and say, name me a couple successful uh, coaches that were in the NBA that went down to the college level and really did a, a great job. There aren't that many, and you look at it and you say, experience matters. And I would be much more uh, in favor of this hire if Juwan Howard had actually had experience coaching and doing things. Just look at uh, what happens in the NBA when there's not a lot of experience. You make a lot of rookie mistakes and things happen. When uh, and, and what was one of the first things that was talked about is Juwan Howard had to kind of bring in uh, uh, people to kind of show him the ropes. And it was openly talked about that, hey, he doesn't exactly know <laughs> the system of how to run things. So he's going to need and he's going to rely on other people to help him out. So the one thing that I will say is, and like I said, I, I don't think that Juwan Howard is the best candidate for the Michigan job. And, and, and Michigan's going to take a step back, I believe, in the next coming seasons where there's going to be some losses that you guys are not going to be happy with. But it will be incumbent. There is a chance. I don't think that Juwan Howard is just destined to flame out. There is a chance that he could have success. And it's going to be incumbent on finding those four and five-star guys to bring into the program. 
Juwan Howard can flash those NBA titles, can flash the fact that, hey, you know, I can text LeBron right now and he'll likely reply. He obviously got endorsed by Dwayne Wade and LeBron James. So he has some things going for him. But at the end of the day, he's got to go to these uh, kids' rooms, and he's got to sell Michigan. He's got to sell Michigan above Duke, above Carolina, and he has to bring in a couple of those guys. And if he can do that, that will definitely uh, make a strong impression on Michigan fans. It'll make a strong impression on the media. And obviously, if you're willing to potentially get the right one-and-dones in the next couple years, guys that can take over the program uh, real quick and handle their business and make some deep runs, things will be okay for Juwan Howard. Talent on the basketball court will make any head coach look a heck of a lot better. So if he can get a couple guys that uh, can come in and make a statement, then he'll likely have success. And that's my uh, my thoughts on that. Now, last thing before we take a commercial break here. A lot of people paid attention to the habits of Jim Harbaugh lately. In that, you know, people, one of their complaints has been that, you know, he's been a little bit too much on social media. So he kind of took a step back in the last few months. But uh, when John Beeline uh, took the job at the Cleveland Cavaliers, noticeably, there was no real goodbye, thank you tweet from Jim Harbaugh. But as soon as Juwan Howard is named head coach, we look and people found that there was a tweet, a congratulatory tweet from Jim Harbaugh uh, congratulating Juwan Howard and saying, oh, you know, we got a Michigan man. Uh, It's a great thing to have a Michigan man coaching basketball. So obviously, we got to read into it a little bit. Do you think that uh, there's been this underlying friction between Beeline and Harbaugh that not a lot of people are kind of digging into that maybe uh, could be looked into because of the fact that, hey, you know, John Beeline had a great cushy situation. Why would he take a job where he doesn't have much experience coaching in the NBA? Why would he leave such a cushy gig at Michigan if, uh, you know, things were great in that Michigan family over there? I like how we have to read into it. I think Uh, we do. I, I think you're right, too. I think we have to look at it. Lisa, I, thank you. I, I, I wonder if there was an issue, if there was some type of a of a of a bad rub there. And I don't know why there would be, because it's not like they compete with each other. It's not like they're they're in opposition of each other for for either recruits or or for players or one is one is taking away from the other. I wonder, and honestly, it would be Beeline. I think that would have the problem with Harbaugh. Right? Beeline has come in, has won more, has basically taking a a program that was in the doldrums, that was overlooked by everybody, and had put it on a national scale, had made it nationally relevant. You know, you talk about Michigan basketball with the likes of, uh, you, you've got your Duke and you've got your North Carolina right here in the upper tier, and then after that you've got your teams like your Villanovas, your, your Michigan States. Michigan was in that tier. They were towards the back half of that tier, but they were in that tier, and John Beeline put them there. John Beeline got them there. And yet John Beeline was making how many million? 3.2 something million? While Jim Harbaugh has won nothing. Has a won lot more. zero and makes how much? Seven, eight, nine million dollars? Do you know what I'm saying? So if anybody was to be pissed off about anything, it should be John Beeline. John Beeline should be furious uh, about how his program is constantly overlooked, how he is underpaid compared to what Jim Harbaugh makes, how... His program always had to take a back seat to the football coach. So there should be no rub or no ill will from from the football coach to the basketball coach. It should be the other way around. And so, yeah, I wonder if there was a little bit of an issue there, if there was some growing tension. I think more of the issue probably and the blame should be pointed toward Manuel. When um, John Beeline flirts with the Pistons, mm-hmm. obviously he's going there to get some insight into yeah, how to interview. Absolutely. And to, obviously we talked he about it. He was almost hired, too. He was leveraging himself to get a new contract. And then, obviously, he got a new contract. But, obviously, he's like, oh, okay, I see what we got here. Yeah. I'm not making uh, nearly as much as Jim Harbaugh. I'm not uh, the top-paid guy. Do you think that Ward Manuel, in the last contract that he offered John Beeline, was disrespectful? And he might have kind of paved the way to kind of ease the decision for John Beeline to move along by not hey, so going, hey, you know what? You're John Beeline. You got a job for the next 20 years. Here's a 20-year contract, $6 million per. Rest easy, my friend. You're, you're a Michigan man. You're here forever. Do you think that maybe the, the Brinks truck should have been backed up to John Beeline in that last offer? And by, by making kind of a lighter offer to Beeline that he said, you know what? I can take more money and uh, find my way elsewhere. He wasn't shown enough love. He was shown love, but not enough to go, hey, you're our guy. Here's the truck. Whatever you want. Tell me your number, and uh, I'll make it a million more. So here's the thing. I, I think there is the possibility of that. John Beeline 
when he left, was the ninth highest paid coach in college basketball. All right. So the pay scales are totally different for college basketball right. compared to college football. All that being said, ninth is not good enough. It, right. It, oh, no, no, no. In, in recent memory, who's been a better head coach, John Beeline or Tom Izzo? You, you answer that as a Michigan State fan. Who's on been, par. I would say on par. And not surprising because uh, I look at that uh, shiny ring that Izzo has. No, no, no. So. I said in recent memory. Yeah, recent not, memory, not, yes. Not over the course of, of what they've done over their, their careers at their re- respective yeah. schools. But in recent memory, in the, last, in the last three to five years, who's been a better head coach? Oh, John Beeline's had better results. Exactly. And Tom Izzo is the fifth highest paid coach. Beeline mm. should have been paid. On par. So, yes. Fourth, fifth, sixth in that range. Somewhere with Tom Izzo. So, yes, I, I think there might have been a little bit of disrespect. And I think if you if you showed Beeline that respect, like, hey, look, we value you as much as Michigan State values Tom Izzo. We're going to give you $4.5 million. Mind you, Izzo makes $4.36 million. If we, We're going to pay you $4.5 million to be the head coach at the University of Michigan. I think what that does is that shows him, you guys do respect me. You do value me. You're paying me more than the the arguably the greatest head coach of college basketball in this state. You're paying, uh, paying me more than him. On top of that, I'm now behind the likes of Coach K, John Calipari, Chris Holtzman at, at Ohio State, which what has that guy done? He hasn't done shit. And Bill Self. I mean, three out of those four names I just named, he would be behind. Those guys are going to go down in, in, in history as some of the arguably the best coaches in all of college basketball. So, yeah, I think there might have been a little bit of disrespect there. And I think he might have felt that. All that being said, I think he also had visions of grandeur. I think Beeline wanted to take that next step. I don't think he was leveraging the Michigan job. I think he legitimately liked being here. I think he liked coaching here. But I think when it was all said and done, if you look at his history, every place he's gone, he has moved on, and he has taken that next step up. That next step up was the NBA. He's got a decent He's got a decent gig coaching in Cleveland. Now, many people are going to turn their attention to Ward Manuel, and uh, I'm interested and curious to see what's going to come of this press conference with Ward Manuel and Juwan Howard today. Pay attention to it. Uh, definitely, we'll cover it as well. Follow us on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. Definitely a big move, a move that uh, many may criticize down the road. So I can't wait to... Uh, see how this plays out with Ward Manuel and the decision that he made hiring Jawan Howard. It's going to be a bumpy ride at first, but let's see how it plays out in one year or, or, or two. Coming up next, we're going to talk about it. Two dysfunctional organizations. I can't wait to hear what Adam thinks about the Lakers and the Detroit Lions in terms of rating. Who's more dysfunctional? All that and more next on this edition of Doc and Jock. Doc and Jock here for the Motor City Pawn Brokers, a great sponsor of the network. The Motor City Pawn Brokers are the one-stop pawn shop when you're in need of short-term cash or are looking for quality brand-name new and pre-owned merchandise. With locations in Detroit, Ferndale, Roseville, and Warren, their mission is to deliver exceptional value. For all information regarding the Motor City Pawn Brokers, you can go online and check out all the deals at MotorCityPawnBrokers.com. And if you do go into one of the locations, tell them the Detroit Sports Podcast sent you, and uh, they'll take care of you there. Make sure you feel comfortable. Great customer service. Again, a great sponsor of the network, the Motor City Pawn Brokers. Go check out today, MotorCityPawnBrokers.com. We can keep this conversation going from the podcast on this great new application called Flick. When uh, we got in contact with the crew over there at Flick, oh man, we got an opportunity to download the app, check it out, create sports forums that uh, a lot of fans go into every single day. So when we have a chance to talk about and debate Juwan Howard, when we're debating the Lakers and the Detroit Lions and who's more dysfunctional, when there's a great big wrestling show like AEW put on last weekend, we can carry the conversation and have live group chats over there at Flick. So all you got to do now, they've made it so great. The IT department over there has made it super easy. All you got to do is uh, go to anywhere that you download apps and type in Flick Chat, and uh, it'll come right up. And when you download the application, all you got to do is uh, add a group, and all you got to do is type in DSP, all lowercase, and you can join the Detroit Sports Headquarters there at Flick. Also, check out our social media platform anywhere you find uh, Detroit Sports Podcast. We'll always put up invitation links as well. You can be part of the Detroit Sports Headquarters in two ways, either joining with DSP the code or you can uh, use one of our invite links at this time. So keep the conversation going. It's a direct way to interact with any of the hosts here, and it's a fun platform. We love working with Flick, a great sponsor of the network.
because I know you've started to read a little bit of that ESPN article. Talk about sour grapes, and I like it. I guess this week is the sour grapes week where people that worked at one place go on other platforms where they go and just start crapping on their former employers. I like it. Obviously, the Lakers source is a former uh, coach that was probably broomed aside in the move to fire Walton. But, oh, my God, the tea that has been spilled. Jesus, talking about different war rooms over there at the Lakers, talking about the fact that Magic Johnson was only there like once or twice a week and things like that. So this offseason has been a complete circus and drama-filled over there in Los Angeles. And there's daily reports of what's going on in terms of Rob Palinka lying to the media with The Rock and uh, telling false stories, backstabbing. Magic Johnson goes on a national television show and starts spilling information going, I don't trust Rob. He's going and talking behind my back about things that should not happen. And when I didn't feel the control, I left. And you, you see all this dysfunction over there at the Lakers. And then you start going, man, how can I tie this into Detroit sports? Oh, is there a dysfunctional organization that we know about? Hell yeah, it's called the Detroit Lions. And so tying it in, I want to get your sense because it's always fun to compare. Which organization do you think is more dysfunctional? The Detroit Lions or the Los Angeles Lakers? I think if you look at the Lions over the course of history, they're probably the more dysfunctional organization out of the two. But looking at them right now, it has to be the Lakers. The, the Lakers are a hot mess. So Jeannie Buss takes complete control of this organization, right? She brooms out longtime general manager Mitch uh, Kupchak. She brooms out her brother, and she's like, cool. We're going to install Magic as the new GM, and we're going to have Rob Palinka here as the president. And what a cluster this has been. You've got Magic saying that that uh, uh, Palinka is stabbing him in his back and talking behind his back. you got Magic running around to the press, spilling all the beans. This has been a complete and utter mess. And from what it sounds like, Magic or, or Palinka wanted to broom aside uh, Luke Walton. And it, it, was, it sounds like it was more at the behest of, 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 uh, of LeBron because they wanted to get Ty, Ru, Ty Lu in there. And it, it just it becomes very, very messy. And one wasn't allowed to do his job while, while the other one was feeding Jeannie Buss different information. It sounds like a complete shit show in L.A. And then you've got LeBron James at the center of all of it, which makes it even more messy because LeBron James, love him or hate him, the guy's a lightning rod, right? Everybody has an opinion on LeBron James. Whether you, whether, whether you think he's the greatest NBA basketball player to ever touch a basketball or you, you, you think he meddles too much with what goes on in the front office or he doesn't like the young players on his team so he gets them all traded away. I mean, you go back to the trade deadline, everybody on that team was dead to rights. They were all going to be traded, all of them. The team was going to basically consist of LeBron James and if they got Anthony Davis. That was it. They were going to roll the ball out there and those two guys were going to play. That was it. Nobody else because they traded everybody else away. And then you fast forward a little bit. Nobody gets traded. LeBron James goes down injured. He sidelined his first major injury of his career where he misses a large amount of time. And Magic gets broomed aside. Rob Palinka now sounds like he is in complete control because he has the ear of Jeannie Buss. And it doesn't sound like Jeannie Buss knows what the hell she's doing. It's a complete mess in L.A. Jesus Christ. That's how I feel. Honestly, it's like a soap opera. It's like a soap opera that that just surrounds sports, man. It's like the basics. I, I want to ask you this, too, because here's something that is unbelievable. So Magic openly says in this interview, which is so amazing to go on first take and say these things. He's like, I tell Jeannie Buss, look, Jeannie, I got businesses that make a lot more money than you're going to pay me. So I'm not going to show up. Really, I'm going to have some times where I got to handle my business. And she's looking at it and like. Okay. Okay. No problem. I'd be like, hell no. You got to commit to this. Right. What do you need? And obviously, when he says that, <laughs> how do you approve that? How do you approve well, do, do you know a guy that says, I got an other job you know to take, make more money? Do you know why? Why? It, it's because, one, he's Irvin. Two, I mean, that's what they refer to him. They don't call him Edge. They call yeah. him Irvin, right? So, so it's Irvin, and he is, he is the Lakers, right? Is there, is there one, is there one figure that is more one sports team? Then Irvin Magic Johnson is the Lakers. But also, Irvin hasn't met a microphone he doesn't like. So I know. this is a guy that comes with some baggage. I know. I, I also think that, obviously, while I love consuming drama, I think— You it, do it, love it. it. That's why you watch the Kardashians. Hell yeah. It's, it's <laughs> drama-filled. I'm, I'm not the only one. Others, <laughs> others, like, others tuned into First Take and were like, ooh, 
<laughs> the memes were uh, outstanding. But I look at it and I go, if you're a genie boss, you know this is coming. You know that if you tell Magic Johnson you got the power and then you surround him with people who want to strip him of that power, yes. he's going to start talking. He's got people, he's got, uh, you know, friends with people who have national platforms. He's going <laughs> to spill the tea so fast that you can't, your head will spin. I find it so fascinating the way he just kind of up and rolled out. Like, he didn't tell anybody. Out. He, he, when he went to the media and was like, yeah, so uh, I'm relinquishing my title as general manager of the Los Angeles <laughs> Lakers. Like, wait, shouldn't you have had that conversation with Jeannie Buss? <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't you have maybe brought in the guy who you're building your franchise around, LeBron James, and maybe let him know? LeBron found out the same way all of us found out. At the same exact time, all of us found out. Like, how does that happen? How do you conduct yourself? Like, I like Magic, but I feel like Magic sometimes thinks he should get a pass to do things because he is Magic. Like, no, bro, you still have to conduct yourself with some sense of decorum, some sense of, uh, 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 of, of professionalism. And I don't think he brought that to that office or that, or, or, or that position. I think that's a big problem. Okay, okay, I've given you the chance. Now, Have roll I made tape. my case? Have I made my case? Everybody listening, roll tape. Record now. Hell no, bro. The Detroit Lions are the most fucking dysfunctional organization on earth. Okay, let's just start with this. So strong. <laughs> Nobody drafts tight ends in the first round. <laughs> Nobody in the history of football does it at the rate the Lions do. Okay, start with that. Okay, now, they change regimes, and they're going to now parade this new offensive coordinator that they got. And he's like, oh, running the football is essential. <laughs> when your best quarterback that you're paying damn near $30 million to has an arm. <laughs> Running is essential. You go and get that guy to uh, take away the privileges of Matthew Stafford. Okay, fine. Mind you, mind, mind you your, your offensive coordinator says his best weapon is his arm, but we're going to run the ball. Players that leave you shine. <laughs> they get over. You go and you stand up there and you tell the entire world, a coach that got you nine wins, okay, a coach that got you to the playoffs a couple times, the place you want to go to, it's not good enough. Okay, you bring in your boy, and your boy doesn't show up to practice on time. It's like, um, doesn't show up to obligations on time. And it's like, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here and demand decorum from you reporters who are getting paid nothing. You know, if, if you work hard and there's a lot of people leaving the field of journalism to take PR jobs because they pay more. Yep. Okay, and you're sitting there, you're going to, you know, ride. You're not their boss. You're going to ride reporters for how they act and treat you. Okay, and what happens? The first report about Patricia is potentially a scandal, okay? Something that he may or may not have done when he was drunk, you know, as a, as a frat boy, okay? So that's what we get here working with the Detroit Lions, where we say, okay, getting to the playoffs probably will get you a parade, okay? You got, uh, you know, you got... Winning, winning a playoff game exactly. will, will get you enshrined. You have an organization that has set the standard for what dysfunction is. We've done a podcast where uh, year in, year out, we get all excited in the offseason going, yeah, they can get 10 wins within one game of the season starting. We're going, oh, man, rookie quarterbacks can handle this. What's the, what are the Lions doing? You see Hail Marys. You see plays that never happen uh, happen to the Detroit Lions. Why does this stuff happen? Why is uh, everything that's supposed to happen correctly for the Lions, why does it always go crooked? Because the Lions are dysfunctional and are led by people, I think, that don't understand that, hey, do the things that are simple first. In the first round, get somebody that has impact. In the second round, you know, utilize those picks that are available to you in the second round and stop taking guys that when you take them go, uh, who's that? Why do we have no film? Oh, the Lions to, uh, selected J Jelani Tavai. Next. No buzz, no impact. And you got guys that have to make impact. That's where you build an NFL team is through the draft. That's right. Right? And so, obviously, Bob Quinn comes in. He's and getting brooms out with those second, third, fourth, and fifth round <laughs> He guys. comes in and he brooms out the entire front office. And the guys that are coming in, you know, you say, okay, he's, he's around 50%, but there is dysfunction. Can we get information from the Detroit Lions? Hell no. It's like the CIA. It's like, okay, you, you guys are going to run. Okay, you're going to use a halfback option or you're going to do a halfback toss left and right. What's the big deal? It's like... You know, they've established a culture that people have now come on in the podcast and told us directly right to our face that you can't get no info that it's like locked down that, hey, if you're the NFL network, you'll get some access. But um, if you're just somebody that wants to ask, like, why did you pay? Why did you decide to pay Stafford and keep him and then shift to a, a, a power run game? Can, can why I, the fuck would you do that? Can I sprinkle a little bit more on, on the Lions argument? are more dysfunctional? So I, I won the argument. I crapped all over. Let, your let me let me sprinkle a little <laughs> bit more. Look, I, 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 I love the Lions and I hate the Lions so much. So they are the most fun. 
becomes easy they're the for most me to, dysfunctional to, situation. Swing to your side here. Exactly. So uh, media day is going on because they got OTAs going on, and the 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 tight. I think it was the tight ends coach said that they have the best catching tight end. And it's not TJ Hawkinson. <laughs> so you invest the first round pick right. in a tight end because he can block. That, that that's that's his calling card. He can block. Not so much that he can catch. That he can block. And you go and, and your seventh round pick, uh, your seventh round tight end that you draft is the best catching tight end that you have. Guys, it, guys, I just it, want you guys to know that's fucked up. Here's some that, more arguments. Fucked up. Here's some more arguments with the four minutes I have left remaining. Okay, <laughs> they let Adam cover the team. Okay, do they not do any research? Do they not go Adam Strozinski? Detroit Sports Podcast, Docket Jock, Episode One Eighty Four. This is the worst fucking franchise on the face of the earth. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, did I say that, that? I think I said that, didn't I? No, somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> They did not do any. Re- they let oh, you in. Oh man, terrible! If you terrible go, if you go and you check the tape, I had at numerous times over yeah. the course of the last six years, I have buried this organization for being a complete and utter cluster. And Adam's out there asking <laughs> staff for questions. Adam's like, "The season's not over. Thanks. I'm not thinking about it." <laughs> <laughs> won't give it won't give Adam a straight answer for the oh, life of him. No, not at all. He hates okay. me. He hates me. That's Two okay. of their players said, "Screw it. I don't want to play anymore." Screw it. I want to walk away and never see the sport again. Okay? <laughs> Granted, then you're like, okay, give me your money. Give me, give me the money back. <laughs> and then you're like, our mission is to get him back a- on board. <laughs> well, well, maybe you, if you thought about that, you wouldn't have jacked $2 million from uh, Calvin Johnson. You know, it's dysfunctional at every level because on one sense, they speak and make decisions. And then the other, <laughs> they, they do things that contradict what they're but, supposed to but, be doing. But wouldn't you agree that with Bob Quinn under, under uh, helm here, they have done a much better job in their drafts. I know we just crapped all over them taking oh, a, a okay. tight end in the first okay. round. Uh, Doc and, and Josh, uh, all you media, <laughs> character is super important. We're not going to draft any bad guys. Oh, he's got a little bit of tail. We'll look at him. <laughs> he's talking out of two sides of his mouth by what he says and what he's doing. So you look at it and go, that's not dysfunctional? Okay. He's trying to play this you know, part of like, I am this esteemed general manager, and I will not go after Kareem Hunt. I will not go after guys that have talent, but uh, I will draft guys that uh, are potential. I will not improve my team within one, sw- one contract. No, I won't do that. I'll rely on a guy that has a knee injury and give him the ball 50 times. <laughs> why would that be a problem? I don't know. Why would anybody criticize us? Why, you know, why, do, why are there so many negative haters out there for this organization? I don't understand all these podcasts that are so negative about the Lions. I literally, off the top of my head, just gave you eight minutes of why this, this organization is dysfunctional. No. Off the top of my head, I was so looking forward to it. And I was like, please, Adam, take the Lakers, take the Lakers. And how we set this up was, I was like, okay, who do you think is more dysfunctional? And you were real and said the Lakers. I said, oh, shit, man. We got podcast gold. Let me talk about the dysfunctional Detroit Lions, free-flowing. Uh-huh. They're fucking dysfunctional on every level. You know the best part is... <laughs> At every level. <laughs> and they got fans that are like, <laughs> one, hashtag one pride. Look, I cannot minutes, believe I saw this. Two minutes into your argument, I wanted to wave the white flag. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. you're right. Okay. <laughs> We're going to end on this, okay? And legitimately, going into this, I was like, it's the Lakers. Okay. It is the Lakers. I'm going to end on this note before we get out of here because time's up. And I won the argument fair and square. Yes, okay. I, you crushed I, me. I scroll Twitter more than anybody on earth, okay? Yes, you do. And... I, I was floored by what I saw, okay? I hate social media, by the way. No, no, it's fine. I love the fans of the Lions. I love them. I love those that are like, but there's this, like I said, this, this loud now growing they're idiots, movement. Though. No, 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 they're not idiots. They're they fans. Are. No, they don't want to bring, listen, the Lions give them enough negativity. They don't need uh, tweets and fans being negative. But I saw this one. It had me rolling. I was going to tweet. They've got to be realists, and they're not. Yeah, exactly. They, they eat and, and, and they drink the cornbread and the Kool Aid and they like smear it all over their bodies like exactly. I was doing with baby oil. I was going to drink drop some nasty comments, but I was like, I'll just let them have it. Someone said, I'm taking a roll call for all the positive hashtag one pride fans so that I know uh, who who truly supports the Lions and who doesn't. So when they're good, uh, y'all can stay off the bandwagon. I was like, fuck I, you and your roll call. I go Look, s- who is it? Who did this? Uh, I, don't, I don't, shout them, don't shout no, them. I don't know who it was. I want to go smack them. Who are, all and, fair, tell me. Because when I see them in person, no, I want to smack them. No, it's the an face. account with, you know, there's a lot of like accounts with 200 followers that are like hashtag one pride where the, the, the Lions uh, hardcore fans that love the Lions. And if you talk negative about them, stay off my timeline. I'm like, look. They're lucky we support, you know, the Lions, but being critical is not something that's toxic because here's the thing. They do it too. They just wait for the off season. They talk crap about the yeah. Lions. They, they, they wait to leave and they say, yeah, the, the organization's run like shit. I, I, I want you to tell me why I'm a bad fan because I hold them to a higher standard. Exactly. Please tell me why I'm a bad fan. 
a guy that has you know no experience in broadcasting just went off on an eight minute tirade on like maybe <laughs> and I just scra- I just scratched the surface. You did too. I just scratched the surface. You of totally that won. You totally won. My That's bad. You, my bad. You're right. The Lions are the worst franchise. They Most, are the more dysfunctional. They are the gold standard, the <laughs> platinum standard of dysfunction. So the Lakers are on the list, though. That that tea that was yeah, spilled, the, holy the shit. The Lakers right now are on the list. Great podcast. I had fun. <laughs> I, for, like, I like how you crushed me. <laughs> for the jock Adam Strozinski, I am the doc John Macaroon. That was cathartic. Felt good. Uh, <laughs> winning a debate. That's oh, good. Thanks, everyone, for downloading the oh, Detroit Sports win. Podcast. You annihilated and, me. Doc and Jock, every Thursday since 2013, you know it. We're the standard. You know it. We're the trendsetters. We appreciate everybody that listens. You can follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z for all the hijinks and hilarity. He's stepping his game up, podcasting a lot more. Check him out. The network at Detroit Podcast. Message us anytime. We'll read it. Good, bad, and different. We love interacting with the fans. See everybody next week for the next edition of Doc and Jock. This was locker room talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. <laughs> Didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They count to me. They understand. They talk to me.